Well, the first thing I wanted to ask you was, where were you born? Uh, Caraway, Arkansas, May 28, 1917. Okay. That's and <laughs> and what, uh, what brought you to, uh, to Michigan? Huh? What brought you to Michigan? Well, uh, obviously I had to go where my dad and mother went. Uh, at about that time, the auto industry started awakening, you might say. It was right uh, exactly at the end of World War I, 1917. Uh, I was born in 1917, of course. And in 1920, 21 was a great influx from all throughout the country to Flint and Detroit. This was the birth, really, or the awakening of the auto industry. My father and mother come here from Arkansas. And my dad got a job in Chevy Motor in the hole, plant four, the favorite hell hole in Flint. The uh, companion to that was the Buick Foundry 10, another vacation spot. Uh, my dad worked in uh, the Chevy for quite a while, on and off, and it was uh, really a, a hell hole. I can remember when uh, I was young is six, seven, eight years old when he was coming home from work. Back in them days, you had street cars. Not every family had a car. Now today, compared, we have many a household that's got not one car, one, two, or three cars, usually a boat or train or something else. The prosperity was just starting to blossom at that time. Now in the 20s, the auto industry was growing. Buick uh, was growing also here in the city of Flint, and that, that necessitated bodies. There comes Fisher body. The South End Fisher made mostly uh, the bodies for a Buick motor, and it made a few for Chevy at, back in the early days. But then the uh, Chevrolet was getting big at the time. Buick was uh, really getting large too. And eventually, my dad got up and uh, uh, transferred up into Buick. Now, in them, back in them days, they transferred you, management transferred their workers to the various plants as needed. Buick, Chevy, Fisher Body, and so forth. And uh, this is how my dad got in, started up in the Buick. He stayed there for several years, many years, and he was in uh, Buick Plant 40. That's the uh, gear and axle machining accomplished at that time. And uh, when I got out of high school in uh, 1936, January 1936, I graduated in Detroit. He worked down there in the Chevy plant a bit just before that, but they come back to Flint. Uh, my brother and I both hired into Buick in uh, October the 10th and the 14th of 1936. But at this time, there were some 20-some years of uh, uh, workings in the industry, General Motors particularly I want to talk about here, where uh, a lot of grievances was multiplying. There was no uh, 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 redress to it at all. You worked at the will of the foreman. Mm -hmm. He was the boss. Mm -hmm. And uh, many a person found out who the boss was. They worked and they were just fired in the middle of the day. That was in the line. Uh, working conditions were equally bad all the way around in the whole industry. Ford Motor Company, Detroit. That was really something else. It was notorious for their treatment of the labor. And the conditions were equally bad. And uh, there was no redress to it. You had no, no outlet to get any corrections made. But all of the accumulations from the uh, uh, American Industrial Revolution, which started way back in the life, possibly in the 1870s, when there was a multitude of small plants, you might say mom and pop industries, making small garden tools or whatever they're doing, because Areas. it was not industrialized. But uh, of all of these thousands of little plants making various items, was uh, absorbed by the growing population. The population was growing and moving west. The railroads coming to being really hot and heavy in the 1870s and the 80s and the 80s and 90s. 
and uh, they had their troubles too. Industry was uh, really ruthless in the treatment of their labor. The accumulated grievances really come to a head. Of all these thousands of little small plants and large plants throughout the country, all the grievances got accumulated at the time of the sit-down strike. Now, the sit-down strike itself was not an American innovation. It's, if you go back in history, it goes way back. Mm -hmm. Even in the biblical times, it's true. What's the example from that? That was. The example was the stonemasons in Egypt. Okay, yeah. Okay. And uh, in our modern times, in the last 150 years or so, all of these grievances come to a head at the time of the sit-down strike, which is uh, we gathered all these grievances together in one pile and we followed the model of the Belgium, the Dutch, and the French. They had sit-downs in these small shops we were talking about. And they got the attention of management. This is the first time there was any real uh, concerted effort to get some of these conditions corrected. So, at this time, when all these grievances in this country, our industrial revolution is really progressing. Many grievances. They all come to a head, and the sit down strike was incorporated and it started out with General Motors, mostly here in this country. But really, the first sit down strike in the, this area here was at uh, Kelsey Hayes in Detroit. A little small parts plant. They had a lot of small plants, 30, 40, 50 employees in each of these locations. Some made door handles, small castings, small parts for the various industries, for General Motors and Chrysler. They had a sit down strike, Kelsey Hayes, and immediately management didn't know how to cope with that. So they had to start negotiating. And this is where all the grievances come to the front. And Kelsey Hayes won that little settlement. And, the, and this took notice in Flint, Detroit. And here comes the sit down strike. It started on December 29, 1936. The sit down strike. South End Fisher was the main one. Chevy in a hole. Plant 4 and Plant 10, they went on strike at the exact same time. The midnight of 19, uh, December 29th, 1936. And this really got the attention of management. They were not used to having the kids uprising like that. But they put up a good front and they had the, the, uh, the management had the support of the National Guard, the police departments and all the courts they were all uh, uh, company people, you might say. You might say in, in the employee of General Motors. Uh, and I can name you a couple of real famous ones right here in Flint. The Godola families issued injunctions that were a few days against the strikers, going to put us all in jail. We had paid attention to that. We knew who they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judge Black, he had, uh, uh, the one report, he had $8,000 in General Motors stock. So guess which way the decisions went. Right. He had instructions over there too. He didn't like strikers either. And we didn't like him either. So. Right. So that was a mutual feeling. Now today, the Gondola family is still practicing law. They live in the Grand Lake area, and this is the fourth or fifth generation. But they finally woke up. They attend some of our events in the labor unions, in labor halls. They're welcome. Mm -hmm. They become human. Right. So. General Motors finally uh, had uh, a hard uh, problem. They were wrestling with a big problem. What to do with these sit-down strikers? They had the support of the courts, the police, and the uh, sheriffs in each of the jurisdictions to hassle these sit-down strikers. And so they tried to shoot tear gas in the plant, South End Fisher in particular. So the cure for that is to chop out all the windows so you get ventilation. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, across the street on the South Saginaw Street, there was a restaurant that fixed the bean soup and had the applesauce and cornbread, and the women's brigade General brought the food to the windows. Mm -hmm. And here's where the battle started. The police come, I have uh, tapes, right?
right here. Uh, the police beat up the women with clubs.